short story, very short, called The Great State of Canada by Jenny Kelleher. Jenny? who fought in the Can-Am War of 1902 to 1905. But my father would only get a certain look in his eye when I brought up the topic. Now that we live in the age of the internet, and since I've had a question from my son about our family's military past, I decided to do some online research. Sitting down in front of my monitor with a cup of chocolate milk one pre-dawn morning, still in my yellow bathrobe, I logged onto the genealogy site I'd recently joined. In the general history section, I refreshed my knowledge of that war, surprised again at just how many casualties there had been on both sides. Canada had suffered losses estimated to be nearly 70% of all its soldiers and 20% of the civilian population. The Northern Territories were nearly uninhabited in 1905 except for Inuit and Métis peoples. Canada had drained its resources dry by the end of the first half of that last year of the war, causing widespread starvation across the land. There had been so many small skirmishes in so many remote locales that when the war had ended, it took nearly seven months for word to entirely spread. The U.S. declared that Canada should henceforth be known as the 25th state, and supplies were immediately sent to northern cities and settlements. Shipments of aid were sent for two full years until settlers from the lower states had farms producing reliability again, and wild land had been cleared for town growth. Schools were quickly erected, and churches, merchant buildings, and more were built in designated areas. Theodore Roosevelt established national parklands and protected waterways from what he termed unstable damming plans. Cries of, head north, head north, sow your sparkling seeds, were heard throughout the lower 24 states and were printed in each major newspaper for several months after the war ended. Mining was a major industry, as was processing minerals and their byproducts. It all seemed, from what the genealogical site stated, that like we'd rescued Canada from itself. There was nothing written of just how well or how poorly Canadians were faring before 1902. Nothing of what had provoked this war in the first place. Land greed, Roosevelt's yearning for more natural resources, none of that seemed likely, given that our own westward expansion still had so much promise. I then searched my family tree on my father's side. Once I had found my two times great-grandpa Menard's middle name, the details and information on his life overwhelmed me. Menard Botel Rogers was an assistant surveyor under doctor and explorer John Ray. He taught Ray many skills of living off the land, hunting, 
boat handling, and snowshoe navigation. It was Ray who took the credit for most of the discoveries that Rogers had in the actuality made. When he was an old man, retired to an Ontario farm, Rogers <laughs> discovered, quite by accident, that the soil around small streams near his home was colored in an unusual shade of blue. Even the fish swimming delicately in those streams were tinted blue, no matter the species. He bottled the waters and the soils and hand-delivered them to a physician friend who had access to the laboratories of the University of Toronto. The substance was then unknown, but it was what we today call uh, phosphatine, the world's most expensive mineral. It was tested and shown to give off a bright light for up to 20 hours after being compressed even slightly. It has the ability to both store and emit energy. It is a deadly poison to humans if ingested or rubbed on the, the skin. But it was a miracle mineral for the new age, and that undoubtedly was what Roosevelt wanted to claim for the United States. That was the true reason for the war. I relaxed against the back of my wooden chair, scowling. So was my ancestor a hero, or was he the root cause of so much turmoil and death, famine and destruction? I thought about foster team then. It was powering everything in my house, my autocraft, my own internal joint mechanisms within their titanium sheaths. It had been the answer to the coal smoke pollution problem that had hurt our atmosphere at the turn of the last century. Now the air is clean. Trees, a lovely shade of brown, all thanks to my ancestors' discovery of that blue mineral. I shrank my computer screen and placed it it back into my robe's pocket. I would never know just how much had been affected by that stroll along a stream that my great-great-grandfather had taken in early 1902. But something told me that life on Earth would have been very different had some other explorer thought of the blue soil as merely an anomaly in that part of Ontario. Or maybe it would have been scientifically tested decades later long after other wars tore our countries apart or led to the destruction of Europe and Africa, like that proverbial flap of a butterfly's wings causing the poles to shift and dinosaurs to become extinct. The world without this discovery can never fully be imagined.
beautiful piece by our founding father, Kurt Meyer, called Tents. <laughs> so good, so obedient. Then came a Sunday dinner at my parents' house in Tipton. We brought Hannah along. I stood in the living room with my aunt, explaining Hannah's brilliance, how she had never barked and never had an accident on the rug. And just as I was bragging about her, at that very moment, she, Hannah, not my aunt, squatted down and shit right there on the rug. In front of she looked up as she did it with a sorrowful apology in her eyes that would become so familiar in the years ahead. <laughs> Hannah only barked a few times in all the years that we owned her. She slept 20 hours a day, followed you around like a shadow for three hours and 50 minutes of what was left, and in that five final 10 minutes, when you let her out to do her business, she'd rock it around the yard like a bullet on crack. <laughs> There have been just a few dogs in my house, but many cats. My first house in Noblesville was a big white Victorian, eventually demolished for the City Hall parking lot on 10th Street. We were so poor then, we pretty much turned off the heat at night. To stay warm, our cat Rudy would slip under the covers, up by the pillows, then burrow down to our feet. He'd get overheated in the night and crawl back out, after a while. Sometimes you wake in the night and find him curled around your head on the pillow. One cold night, Rudy was burrowing out and got the covers and my ex-wife's flannel nightgown mixed up, <laughs> crawling up her gown without noticing. <laughs> she woke with a frantic cat clawing and trapped against her chest. <laughs> and so she was immediately frantic and crawling, unbuttoning the neck so he could get out. And of course, the hardest part about having pets is when they leave us. I stayed home from work one day when my son Jack was four or five years old. During the morning, we found Rudy had died where he often slept, curled up under my bed. He'd gone peacefully. I wrapped Rudy in an old blanket, dug a hole behind the garage, and buried him, making a grave marker from a landscaping timber, spelling Rudy on it with a router. Jack watched all this with fascination. When his older brother Cal got off the school bus, Jack led him to the grave and described Rudy's death and burial. Then Jack eagerly asked me, with a broad smile on his face, can we dig up Rudy's accountancy? <laughs>
When the heart cries out, who will hear, if even you do not understand? Who will account for the silent injustices, unseen wounds? Beloved, give voice to your anguish, your rage, your shame. Call upon me to find the healing balm for hands wounded by a violent world. This is my greatest wish for you, a prayer uttered with every breath, fervent, set to each footstep of my life. I know your pain because it reflects my own. I am helpless in its wake, though I call upon all that I know. I only have this to give you. What my blood runs the same when it reddens the earth. Maybe this is hope. When we meet in our suffering, when the only prayer I know to be true is uttered between silences deeply known. I am here because you draw breath. I love you. Aww. So I want to say a couple more poems. Uh, I I spilled the beans a little bit. I believe I um, when I formatted the book, I put Spike's collection last because I thought it was just such a fitting way to end the um, submissions that we received. Um, but on that note, we're going to continue. We're not done. <laughs> so, next up we have Tim A. Baker with his short story. It's really kind of almost a poem story called Confusion. Tim, it's all yours.
would always fill me with dread. Once, when the sky turned gray, I worried for someone far away. Although, at the time we were miles apart, I could not ease my worried heart. As the weather raged on and on, with a fury ever so fiercely strong, at home I could not ignore the eerie chill of the happenings far away in Noblesville. The winds collided and the rain poured, a tornado formed and it roared. It came and tore through the place, sparing all. So again, I've seen my loved one's face. something 
today just to mess up your routine. Who knows, what it would, who knows it could be fun. Will thought about it. He figured it could definitely make for a better Saturday afternoon compared to staying inside, doing what they had been doing for the past few days. After finishing up the level of the puzzle game he was on, he answered, I hate to make you jealous. Why not go outside? Let's skate until she gets here. Will noticed how Trent's face sort of lit up with jealousy, and Will enjoyed it a bit, maybe too much. Without saying a word, the two started cleaning up the place. Disgusted looks took hold of their faces as they stacked empty pizza boxes, and groans followed as they gathered gnarly two-liter soda bottles and began stuffing them in the trash bag. Better clean it now rather than risk the wrath, wrath of Trent's mother, who worked long days at the hospital. Eventually, they took a break to have some sun tea, and when they went outside with the pitcher and glasses, Sophie showed up. As she came up the driveway, Trent nudged Will and whispered, You lucky shit. <laughs> Once she came within a few yards of them, she took off her sunglasses and slowly greeted them. Hey, boys, how's it going? Neither, neither of them answered at first. As always, they were both a little awestruck by her. Then Trent chuckled, Good, but we are bored as all get out. Good to see you, Sophie. She ambled around the driveway playfully. I was hoping we could go for a drive, Trent. Up to driving around a bit. Trent took a drink of his tea, checked the time, and then looked back at her. I'm sure Will here wouldn't mind throwing me some gas money for the time we spent out there, would you, Will? <laughs> Will looked away from Sophie briefly and replied, Yeah, man, sounds good to me. <laughs> well, then it's settled. I'll get my keys, Trent hollered as he retreated into the house with a slam of the screen door. You know, Will, we could go down by the river for a while later on if you want. Maybe for the sun to go down and the fireflies to come out, Sophie said. Anything for you, Will answered. Next up, we have a song by Miss Jean Roberts again. This one's called Talking in the Amp.
Now about halfway down the big hill lived a medium-sized, wiry-haired black dog who did nothing but lie on the porch all the live long day just waiting for boys on bikes. <laughs> we knew this. This was one mad dog, not rabid and deranged, mind you, just always pissed off. <laughs> when a bike came down the big hill, this bulgy-eyed maniac would tear out across his yard, snapping and growling as he attempted to grab the leg of an unsuspecting cyclist, pull him from the bike, and proceed to chew on that young man's shin and calf until the owner might come out and pull him off. We knew this, too. As we approached the crest of the hill on this particular day, we reminded Jimmy of the menace. Jimmy knew the routine. So by the time we began our descent, Jimmy had jammed that new blue stingray fast back into fifth gear and was already flying down the hill well ahead of my brother and me on our single speed secondhand jalopies. <laughs> sure enough, out came Blackie about the time that we could see Grandpa in the distance sitting in one of those old red metal chairs on his front porch. He was watching the challenge unfold. <laughs> Papers 
and magazines. She can't go far. She can't go fast. She can't get a kink in her oxygen line, but she can go farther than I can, and I'm jealous. Monday morning, I want a shower. I haven't had a shower since last Tuesday morning. Patients on 8 West are only allowed sponge baths. Patients on 8 West are typically, typically die within, eight, within 72 hours of arrival. I didn't die. I do smell. My hair feels like oleo. I want a shower. It takes three hours and eight phone calls to arrange it. A terrified teenage nurse's aide is told to help me. I promise her I will neither faint, nor fall, nor wheeze from this effort. I shower. Outside the bathroom door, she frets. We both survive. She goes on break. I go to sleep. Showers are exhausting. Tuesday again, late afternoon. When we get home, Amy lights a fire in the wood stove and rearranges furniture in the family room. She shoves easy chairs together to make a change lounge. Mom, this room needs a sofa, she pants. I got you clean clothes from upstairs. If you need anything else, let my brother get it when he gets home. I'll be back in the morning after Ben goes to school. Wait till I'm here to take a shower. My baby issues orders as she arranges parts of my dinner beside the microwave. Then she bundles her baby against the cold. We pass kisses around, and I watch the escort's taillights disappear into the dark. In the bathroom, I find a clean, soft, flannel nightgown. It buttons in front and doesn't open in the back. I take a moment to appreciate the utility of hospital. I appreciate more my faded flannel, my freedom from IV lines, pumps, and oxygen tubes. All right, that was awesome. Thank you, Joe. Next up, we have If Looks Could Kill by Mary Thornberry. and cough up his own. And my heart broke for the boy on the street, screaming for someone to see. There are some things in life we can never forgive ourselves for. And that night, listening to a drowning kid trying to hold his head above water, but never leaving my bed, I adopted guilt as a lifelong pet. Because 
There was a boy in my class who did not like to talk and glared at everyone passing him by. He was small and pale and thin, and his bones could be heard crunching wherever he went. I only read him old jokes and poems on the back of chocolate milk cartons. But we are bigger children who crave attention, and I gave up before I could wallow. If looks could kill, I died every day from that boy or sad eye into my own. Just talk to me, I think. Too full of shame and longing for a kid that I've never really known. The boy didn't speak, and he didn't laugh, and he didn't smile. He stayed out all night in the freezing cold without a jacket on, growing up in bushes and causing a forest. Then, one day in December, before school let out and Christmas fantasies rolled our heads, the boy didn't come back inside. And for three days, no one knew where he was, and no one cared. Until the dogs found his body by the trees he used to climb when he was young and little, and still smiled all the time, frozen and stiff, with blood-stained puke stuck to the side of his cheek. I sat on the bench where I read him old jokes and stories I wrote when I was sad, and I cried for a boy who would never listen again. They blew the flags at half mast for less than a week, and at the funeral, nobody came to weep for a child that we never really cared about, to weep without knowing his name. I decided to speak at the service, words from the only friend he might have had. I wrote the eulogy on a jug of chocolate milk and read a poem I saved just for him. There's a boy in my class who doesn't like to talk, who doesn't have a bag or a books or a pen, but when I pass him his text, it always says 100%. Between her finger and nail and studied it. The screen door slammed. 
lock up your valuables, I'm home. Byron's usual greeting had been funny the first time, and normally she smiled. Today she was both frazzled and irritated.
He normally was generous with me. He gave me rides in his sports car, bought me a BB gun and a science kit, and he introduced me to little Andy Fanny and Playboy when I was a preteen. <laughs> All of that was in the future. At this time, he was home from the Marines, was spending a lot of time at local bars in town. I called him a few days later and asked him about Santa's behavior at our house. Gary, in the process of making a bologna and potato chip sandwich, <laughs> gave me a long look and asked me what I thought. I didn't think Santa smoked cigarettes. <laughs> Gary looked at me. I didn't think he drank highballs. <laughs> Gary continued to look at me. And he cussed. Gary smiled and said, so, what do you think? I don't think that was Santa. <laughs> but everybody acted like he was. I think everybody was lying to him. Is that all he said? No, I said. I don't think Santa's real anymore. Who was that on Christmas Eve? <clears throat> that was my friend Ben, he said. He came into the bar handing out candy canes. I brought him home to give you one. Why did everybody lie to me? Do you like the presents? Gary said as he spread miracle whip on his sandwich. <laughs> yeah, I said. So why do you care if everybody lied to you? Act like you believe the lie and lie right back to them. <laughs> it, it doesn't seem right to me, I said. So what? Take the presents. Merry Christmas. He gave me half of his bologna and potato chip sandwich and sat down at the table. I sat down next to him, <laughs> took a crunchy bite, and thought about this new perspective. Lying was good. <laughs> this could change everything. <laughs>
this song, uh, I suppose it's a love story. It ends better than some love stories. Perfect world. Sat down to think, but my thoughts they all scattered. I could gather them back, but what would it matter? I mean, maybe I could. Why even try? I could drink in my coffee, lean back, and close my eyes. Well, then I looked up as my darling walked in. She gave me a kiss and asked how I'd been. I said, much better now. A beautiful friend. That made her smile, so she kissed me. Took a walk in the garden and I picked her some flowers. Laid around the house for a couple of hours. Couldn't imagine a place in the world any better. Wished I could stay right there with her forever. And that's just the way that my morning went by. Well, no, really, it's not. When I opened my eyes, my coffee was cold. The morning had flown away in the daydream. Just be here all along. And there goes my mind and I'll wander again. It always comes back, I just never know when. So here I'll sit and here I'll stay while a part of me is worlds away, worlds away from reality. All the places I go. Things that I see, but I'd never come back. No, I'd never come back. If it was up to me. Well, there's the things that I have, but a lot more that I want. Some dreams come true, but most of mine don't. So I warmed up my coffee, but what do I care? I yawned and I stretched and sat right back down in my chair. Oh, and there goes my mind up wandering again. It always comes back, I just never know when. So here I'll sit and here I'll stay while the part of me is worlds away, worlds away from reality. Oh, the places I go, the things that I see. But I'd never come back. Well, I'd never come back. It was up to me.
and Tamir and Eric and the Charleston Nine. They vibrate like a plucked string. And Goodman and Schwerner and Cheney, the shudder after a throne. And Addie Mae and Cynthia and Carol and Denise. Two, memory, a thread drawn taut, reaching back farther than we can see. It is said that ancestors hold the plectum that releases a tone, all that is known and not yet known, a note that should be heeded. But memory triggers painful hymns rolling sea billows of sorrows that signal that no, no, it is not well with my soul. Because the vibration is never ending and travels the infinite length of that string. Three, a mother calls police about a man who manhandled her young son and she is tackled and taken to jail. It takes me instantly back to a white security guard's hands clenched on my arms in a department store. In my mother's eyes, I see fierceness and fear. Emmett's mother said, leave the coffin lid open. I wanted the world to see what they did to my baby. Four. Emmett Till's accuser said in 2016 that she lied about the details of the 1955 event that incited the disfiguring torture and murder of Mamie Till's baby boy. Some of us weren't born yet, but we remember. Like flashbacks, Medgar Evers' widow had, upon hearing the sounds of a certain candidates rallies. Five. In 2017, Georgia, a police chief gives a rare apology for a lynching that happened in 1940. He apologizes to the black people, many who weren't alive then, but they never forgot. He says, there are relatives here and people who still remember even if those people are not still alive, down through the generations that memory is still alive. Six. Erica Garner was named for her father, Eric, who told the police who were choking him that he couldn't breathe and he died. Erica spoke out until she could no longer breathe, and she died. Seven, vibrations, hymns, go on and on and on. No, it is not well with my soul. Chicago is vibrating. Indianapolis is vibrating. America is vibrating. Echoes of dissonant notes, memory, memories, known and not yet known, lived and not yet lived. Trayvon and Sandra and Jimmy Lee and Emmett and
the end of the presentations. I don't want everybody to run away because I want to have Sarah come up and we want to um, uh, talk a little bit about what's next at Logan Street Sanctuary and what we're up to and encourage you guys to keep um, supporting the arts and, and, and actually really participating in some of the events we have here, which I'm going to have Sarah tell you about one of them. Um, I also just want to take a moment real quick to just say, uh, putting this book together, it, yeah, it's a lot of work and all that, and I go on and on about that a lot, but there is nothing like putting a book like this together, and there is nothing like a night like this where we can all hear all these stories, and, and I mean, we had, I'm not kidding, over 140 submissions, and everything from bug stories to aliens to <laughs> ghost stories, I mean, you name it, it's in that book, so... Um, I really thank you all for coming out and enjoying this with us, and Sarah's going to talk a little bit about our nice event, because we really hope that some of you guys are going to participate in that, too. And again, as a reminder, any author, whether you presented today or not, immediately come up here when we conclude and we'll do a group picture. So I'm inviting you to save the date for September 29th, for NICE, and that stands for Noblesville Interdisciplinary Creativity Expo. It took us a while to come up with something that NICE would stand for. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. But the concept behind that is that we take works of classic literature, um, specifically quotes from them, and then we want artists of any type, whether you're a cake decorator, musician, um, you make sculptures, to then create works inspired by those pieces, either the books as a whole or specific quotes from them. And we will also have a series of workshops that go hand in hand with those. Check out our Facebook page um, for those dates. And drum roll, the book selections after much debate are much, the, much, much debate. <laughs> yes, the Three Musketeers, the Odyssey, the Brothers Karamazov, and Follow the River.
cheese heads. <laughs> no, just cheese. Ready? We're ready. Poster review 2018 in the books. Yeah. Two, the book is in the books. Three. Is this guy the official photographer? <laughs> 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 Take, it, take a look now. All right. Sure it's good. Yeah, it's My voice That's dropped out of me. The last two days I'm like, I'm not even going to go. Patrick did it. Patrick, you got to go. I have what I can for you. What's that? Yeah. How did our lot deed go? We'll go away.